Oh, finally. Hello, everyone. Hello. Good morning. Hello, Hello Marco. Can you hear me? Hey, Hi. Marco. Hello. Hello, so I guess we'll just proceed or let's wait for three more minutes. Um, yes, yeah, so let's proceed. Uh, let me check uh, that everybody is online. Uh, we should be having 10 attendees at the moment. So okay. let me see from the gallery view. It's not, it's not easy to find everybody online. I think we can site do we have all of our speakers for this session yes yes vanessa shared a mail that she cannot attend as a participant uh who cannot attend sorry let me check vanessa uh, is just dropping an email to everybody saying a participant but just like a uh, Ah, Vanessa cannot attend the panel. No, no, she can attend, uh, but she is not she a can, panelist. She cannot uh, join. She is okay. an attendee, not a panelist. So, if uh, Vanessa can hear us, I'm not sure if she can. Basically, what worked for me was to go out, log out of Zoom, and then log in again ah. as a panelist. Ah, no, okay. it's okay. You, you just give me access. Oh. Davide, Simone, grazie mille. Ah, perfect. perfect. Hi, Vanessa. Hi. And so we are waiting for Imran, I think. So may I ask the technical staff, are we online already or not? Uh, I don't think we are, right? I think we are. So, uh, then uh, so I would like to welcome our session chair, Marco. The floor is uh, yours. Okay. Thank you very much. So, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Marco Luca Marini. I'm chairing this industry session, and uh, I'm from the University of York. And today I'm very happy to have uh, a very nice uh, selection of panelists. Uh, before I get there, I ask the technical staff if, if I can uh, share my screen. Please. Okay, thank you very much. Also, Recording in progress. Uh, I don't seem to be able to share in screen at the moment. Okay, now should be better. Thanks a lot. Right. Okay, I hope you can all uh, see my screen. I just wanted to give uh, a quick introduction and uh, and a summary for this industry session. So, uh, as I said, welcome to everybody. Uh, let me just quickly remind the procedure to ask uh, questions. And uh, this is by writing questions in the Q&A box, or you can raise your hand and uh, I will unmute you. Uh, and so you can ask a question. Um, let me summarize a couple of uh, highlights from last year's industry session, which uh, I think were was quite nice uh, um, an event and uh, we started from a sentence from Nicolai Gisen uh, in 2015 where he said that uh, either KD will find its market in years time so before 25 or it will die and we were happy to see that actually there were plenty of industries already last year so the market was found alive and active and um, with uh, important investment, especially in the QKD satellite sector. 
Uh, then we sort of raised questions about satellite or uh, fiber-based QKD when the former becomes uh, most, more cost-effective than the latter and there were opinions from uh, Rupert Ursin, QT Labs, after 100 kilometers because this cost can be shared between many users. Bruno Huttner from Medicantique said 1,000 kilometers because at that point uh, the fiber-based QKD uh, stops being uh, effective and we need quantum repeaters. And Andrew Shear said, well, for intercontinental distances, because until then we can use the trusted node architecture. So I think this was uh, this is just an example of a couple of interesting scientific outcomes from last year, and I hope we can have similar outcomes this year, where we select um, uh, 10 UKD suppliers, 10 companies. Some of them are uh, well established in the field and uh, running from a long time. Uh, others are startup. Uh, some of them invest uh, on uh, discrete variable QKD, the VQKD, others in uh, CVQKD. So we will hear from them, uh, from the panelists, uh, why they chose one technology or the other and um, why they think this technology can uh, actually uh, reach the market. So each panelist will have uh, five minutes to present, uh, slightly more, because uh, in Italy we had um, 12 companies, but two of them, Quantum Citec and Quasky, couldn't make it to the meeting today, so we are 10 companies now. And uh, we asked each uh, panelist uh, to, to comment on the following five points. The first was about the QKD market in the, the next five to 10 years. Uh, the second one was about the main technical element they chose to uh, create a competitive advantage over the other suppliers. The third one was uh, what can researchers of QCrypt audience do to help the market and uh, to, to help the QKD industry and what technical gaps should, uh, should be filled by the QKD research. The fourth point was about standardization, how this standardization uh, going on in uh, bodies like ETSI, ISO, uh, ITU, or uh, even the standardization of post-quantum cryptography, PQC at NIST, can influence the adoption of um, and actually your company's plan for penetrating the market. And finally, you can ask questions to the other panelists and the other uh, companies. So, without further ado, uh, let me uh, stop sharing my screen. And uh, I will move to our uh, first uh, panelist. The panelist will be uh, speaking in order of um, in alphabetical order for, for, from the company name. And so, the first speaker is uh, uh, Tobias Goering from uh, CryptQ. I'm very happy to welcome you. Uh, so, uh, I'll have you prepare uh, your screen uh, and you can say your screen. Tobias, I will give you a brief introduction. So, Tobias Goering is Associate Professor at the Department of Physics at the Technical University of Denmark, DTU, and he's co founder of Alia Quantum Technologies and CryptQ. Um, CryptQ is a project funded by Innovation Fund Denmark, which aims at developing a continuous variable quantum key distribution system. So, Tobias, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me into uh, the industry panel, and thank you for the introduction. So I'm uh, leading the CryptQ consortium. And uh, so what, what is CryptQ and what's the consortium? So we are a Danish consortium and uh, Denmark is a small country with around 5 million inhabitants uh, in the northern part of Europe. And the consortium consists of uh, players from industry and uh, also academic players. And uh, we have, uh, for example, companies um, Cryptomathic, CyberSafe, and NKT Photonics in there. I will explain uh, on the next slide what they do. We have uh, a company called EnergiNet. EnergiNet is um, the power distributor in Denmark running the um, energy net. And we have Danske Bank, which is uh, the biggest uh, Danish bank uh, in Denmark. So they, these two are 
uh, basically our uh, first use cases um, where we demonstrate our technology. Uh, from the academic side, uh, we have uh, Aarhus University working on photonic integration and uh, the Technical University of Denmark, DTU, that's uh, myself working on continuous variable QKD. We also have the Danish National Metrology Institute. Um, um, they are uh, experts in continuous variables as well as of one of not so many uh, national metrology institutes and uh, they are looking into validation. So what do we do? So we have a um, whole set of technology uh, in the consortium available. Um, at DTU, we are mainly focusing on developing the continuous variable quantum key distribution systems. At the moment, they are still uh, academic systems, but uh, with the prospect of uh, commercializing them in a spin out uh, very soon. CyberSafe is a company who develops uh, AES layer two encryption uh, devices. You can see their 100G uh, box uh, on top. And uh, they are now offering a uh, Etsy key management interface um, to run with QKD keys. Cryptomathic is a software company. They are mainly uh, working with cryptography in the financial sector. So they are offering uh, key management uh, systems up to now or before uh, our start, mainly in um, with classical keys, but now also with quantum keys. And they are working on a QKD data processing software. And KT Photonics uh, is a laser manufacturer working on single frequency continuous wave uh, lasers. Let me go into a little bit more detail about our CVQQD technology. You can see uh, the boxes on top uh, called uh, QTREX, TX and RX for receiver and transmitter, and uh, a small TREX as logo. Uh, our technology is uh, based on Gaussian modulation of coherent states, and we make heavily use of uh, digital transmitter and receiver. That means that uh, we have a rather simple uh, optical subsystem and the transmitter consisting of just a laser, an IQ modulator, and a variable attenuator, and the receiver, a coherent uh, receiver that uh, works as RF heterodyne detection with a frequency detuned uh, laser as local oscillator. And all the synchronization uh, that is required uh, is performed in digital signal processing, um, making it easy to, to change and having a really simple uh, hardware setup. We recently uh, demonstrated uh, composable security against collective attacks with a system uh, recently published in Nature Communications, and we demonstrated a reach of around 60 kilometers, um, which you can find in that uh, archive publication. So when asked uh, about uh, open questions uh, for, the, for the research community, so what we think is important is uh, for once photonic integration for cost reduction. Right now systems are fiber based and uh, can with photonic integration, it's possible to reduce uh, the cost uh, considerably. Another thing that in, at least in continuous variables is not very well studied are side channels um, and how they affect uh, the system security. So this is uh, there's definitely room uh, for improvement and uh, what we call better security proofs. So there is a lot of, uh, we have good security proofs for continuous um, uh, modulation. So, but uh, with efforts in, in discrete modulation, uh, but there's still a gap uh, between them and uh, they are good efforts, but uh, we should also keep the pace and uh, improve those and also look into um, receiver um, discrete receiver techniques, basically. Uh, this is also that was just started to be studied. So this is something um, that should could be looked at um, from a security point of view. Another thing I want to mention is use cases and standardization. Um, often when we approach uh, companies, uh, we hear, yeah, this QKD is a very interesting technology and we like to learn about it. And this is exactly the point that um, 
if you look, if you go to the IT departments, they do not know what quantum key distribution actually is, and you have to teach them. And but then they are very interested and really like to try out uh, the technology and uh, like to investigate of how they can use this in uh, their infrastructure and for what they can use it. At this stage, uh, standardization is not so important, also certification is not so important, but it will come. So when we go into production networks and we talk to, um, for example, Danske Bank, this Danish bank, uh, they say, okay, yes, uh, the systems should be FIPS 140 certified, so that's for the financial sector. And this means that uh, standardization will become important, and right now, as as a system developer, it is important because it helps not to develop own protocols. Why should we in invent own protocols if uh, we can use uh, standard ones and uh, it prevents vendor locking? And uh, with this, I would like to thank you and uh, looking forward to, uh, to the panel discussion. Thank you, Tobias. Uh, perfect timing and uh, congratulations for the little logo. Very nice. Um, also, you raise the good points, and uh, I am sure that the next uh, panelist can also comment on some of them, because uh, he also is a vice chair of the ETSI QKD ISG. So, this is very much related to standardization. Um, I cannot uh, see uh, pressing questions in uh, the chat uh, or uh, raised hands. Please let me know if if I'm missing some of them. Otherwise, I will move on straight away to the second panelist, um, who is uh, Montreal Peeve. Uh, he has a, a long history uh, in um, QKD, is one of the main contributors to this field. And uh, currently, he works as a group leader of uh, the Quantum Technologies Group in um, the Munich Research Center in Huawei Technologies Dusseldorf. And uh, the group developed advanced and highly flexible and stable CVQKD prototypes that are presently successfully tested in uh, the Madrid testbed and uh, within the EU project OpenQKD. So, Monchi, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you very much, Marco. Uh, do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. I'll try my best now uh, to be in the time. Okay, so first uh, let me try to see how this works. Um, so this, okay, so who we are. Um, so as a group, you have already mentioned, uh, this is a quantum communication group at the Munich Research Center. It is uh, a part of uh, uh, the bigger group, uh, which is uh, quantum and topical technologies. And how, what is our mode of development? This is maybe important to mention here. Uh, we are strictly a research group in Germany. We belong to Huawei, which is a very established company, as you know. But uh, we operate in strict compliance with export control regulations with the European Union, which means the technology and power developed in the EU remains there and is not uh, exported to any other country or region of the world. Um, okay. Uh, and actually, we develop prototypes and not <laughs> written here, not products and not products yet, because uh, you know, production is a different branch of a way. So we're developing prototypes. However, the prototypes are you know, intrinsically uh, oriented towards, uh, let's say, industry. They have full cookie systems, not just sex sections of it, not, let's say, optical or whatever uh, segments. Uh, and um, the stability, transportability, and installation readiness has been demonstrated, as Marco mentioned, in existing uh, uh, test beds and uh, their performance and uh, interoperability with products of other European vendors has been proven. Yeah. So, plans for industrialization and also answer to the first question of what I cannot give because uh, this depends on other factors. Uh, but okay, so this is how it is at the moment. We have, let's say, almost product ready prototypes, but productization is a question of the future. 
Okay, so the fundamentals. I just need to repeat here what, uh, let's say, uh, to be a set, uh, we have uh, chosen a very similar paradigm to them. So we have tried to, let's say, uh, minimize uh, at uh, the most, uh, let's say, the, the hardware and the optical segment and transform, transfer everything to the logical domain where things are much more flexible and easy to do. Uh, we are doing Gaussian modulation, or of course, as you know, real Gaussian modulation is not possible, but pseudo Gaussian modulation with a very high resolution, which also, as most of you know, is completely sufficient uh, to um, carry the security proofs. And um, let's say the system is very flexible and it's adapted for an integration in software defined networks, uh, with uh, it, uh, and they can be fully steered. Uh, and especially the quantum layer can be produced, which is important for standardization, as I will briefly mention later. The present performance uh, is, in fact, uh, as you see, two things are interesting. As you see here, distance in kilometers at about uh, 0 0.2 decibel per kilometer, uh, so which is uh, going to the direction of 110. Yeah symptotically even sometimes 120 uh, but okay i don't want to quote this the red dot the red dots are really experimentally uh, chosen uh, it's, uh, let's say experimentally proven let's for is experimentally proven performance as you can see the rate is not very high uh, uh, especially in the beginning and this is due to the error correction codes uh, which are used and which are adapted for longer distance another point is uh, um, which uh, should be mentioned is the possibility for call propagation, which is a feature of um, CV2KD. And you see here the number of channels which are feasible at uh, shorter distances. And uh, here the distance and not the attenuation is important because, uh, let's say, the killer of call propagation is uh, Raman scattering. And as you know, Raman scattering is a function of distance, not of attenuation. Yeah. And uh, you, well, we'll demonstrate this uh, in short. Our trusted detector noise, which is the key for the longer distances, is very low, and you can see the figure 0 0.3 uh, millishot much units. Yeah. Okay. So this is the present uh, uh, part of the present test bed in Madrid. At least this part where our devices are integrated. You can see, uh, let's say, the names of the nodes. Uh, you can see our devices, which are uh, mentioned, or let's say, noted, denoted as QTX and QRX uh, uh, receive uh, transmitter. And uh, you can also see on the right-hand side, because this is an integration of two separate networks, that of Telefonica and of Ready Madrid, which is a um, academic provider in uh, academic uh, network provider for universities uh, in Madrid. And you can see also devices by Toshiba and by the Quantic and co coexistence even on the same fiber um, is very easy, especially because uh, Toshiba and the Quantic systems and the corresponding site are working at 15, 15 nanometers. Yeah. While CVQPD um, is uh, operating as we have done it in the CBAC. Yeah. Okay, just to try uh, to give you a short example of this, uh, the picture, just our devices. And um, here is the general scheme. And uh, you can see that uh, some of the devices can operate on several channels, or in this case, two channels, C37, C38. Um, let's say the distances are not high, uh, but the attenuation is terrible, as you see in a moment, which is a consequence of the fact um, that um, this is a real world network and in the real world networks uh, things like 0 0.2 0 0.25 dp uh, let's say sounds like uh, not realistic yeah and uh, you can also see the switching capability uh, through these uh, switches there as a result just to speed up so we can although we have uh, deployed only 10 devices five receivers five senders uh, we have demonstrated many, many connections which are possible. So here is a selection of them, but in fact, all feasible connections are uh, 36 and uh, they're loop-free links uh, and they can be realized only with five transmitters and five receivers. Here are the messages 
CVQ PD for relatively short distances, like metro distances, but really big metropolitan cities, um, can uh, go um, to much more connections with much less devices. So here, switching uh, directional and wavelengths one can be essentially noted. On the right, you see a table with uh, the exact uh, performance, uh, where you see the names of the devices. I mean, they are strange a bit taken <laughs> from the um, so Game of Thrones, I think, uh, and uh, the, the performance of DB and the distance, whereby uh, many of these uh, links operate, uh, let's say, on the um, same medium. Please, Mont, uh, how the please Mont, you'll, uh, go to your final slides, please. Yeah, um, and and my final okay. slide. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted uh, to mention that, uh, in fact, standardization is very, very important. And uh, in addition to the TIP certification, there is a new uh, certification scheme ongoing in Etsy that is on common criteria by the German, let's say, in cooperation with the German PSI, who is not an Etsy member, and another important standardization institution, especially for European participants, is the forthcoming Joint Technical Committee of Sense and Relay, uh, which I welcome anybody to, let's say, to, be, to take interest in. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monchil, uh, for the nice presentation. I think uh, uh, in the interest of time, we should move on directly to the next speaker, even because I don't see a question uh, at the moment in the chat. So uh, the next uh, panelist, uh, is uh, Jean-Sébastien Pego. Please uh, start uh, arranging your screen. Thank you for that. So, uh, Jean-Sébastien worked uh, at NIST uh, for several years and then uh, came back to Europe and joined uh, ID Quantique in uh, 2018. He participates in uh, bus business development in the quantum security divisions which develops uh, next-generation quantum-safe solutions and especially quantum key distribution systems. So, Jean-Sébastien, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Hello, Marco. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Thank you uh, also, QCrypt organization, um, for this great hybrid event. So, I imagine most of you know uh, ID Quantic. It has been founded 21 years ago as a spin-off of uh, Geneva University from uh, Nikola Gizang Group. And the CEO is Grégoire Ibordi, one of the founders. Uh, IDQ has been focusing on developing uh, products in quantum sensing and quantum security. In quantum security, IDQ proposed uh, two families of products, QNG chips, QNG, and QKD, uh, which is the topic of today. And we go beyond uh, QKD point-to-point -point, uh, deployment now. And this is a topic uh, of this uh, presentation is around QKD networks. Uh, using QKD products that we have developed uh, over the years. Um, so our objective effectively is to be able to um, deploy uh, QKD networks and it means to add uh, QKD to existing uh, secure data uh, networks. Um, so we can map uh, existing network topology and distribute symmetric keys to any nodes of the network. Um, in order to do that, we use uh, mainly two products today in our portfolio, uh, which I will introduce. Uh, the service G targeting access connectivity on last mile, and um, the Clavis XG uh, offering longer range and uh, higher key rate for backbone connections. So in terms of uh, service XG, as a snapshot, it's um, a very compact uh, integrated uh, device integrating the QKD and the KMS layer uh, offering uh, C-band and O-band up to 18 dB um, and we recently announced and, and launched the Clavis XG so the Clavis XG um, is using the same hardware um, uh, chassis and KMS layer but a different uh, QKD optical layer so it is based on uh, DB84 uh, decoy states offering um, higher range and higher key rates than, than the service XG. This is not only about uh, so the QKD layer, but also, of course, the KMS and configuration management uh, layer. So 
the KMS layer is integrated um, can, uh, in the QKD uh, node, uh, so part of the uh, KD device, and we integrate um, with the um, uh, SDN uh, layer uh, and configuration monitoring, which is very important for, uh, of course, to um, configure and manage the networks. We follow um, the standards, of course, um, from ITU, etc., um, for example, and we integrate um, with uh, the different layers implementing um, various interfaces. So you, you can see on this slide the interface um, proposed by Etsy, KD0, 15, and 18 to, to the SDN layer, 14 to the consumer layer, uh, draft uh, interface uh, for external KMS or also party KMS, um, and of course to the QKD uh, KD layer. So the objective and, uh, is to deploy networks. So we, we started already a few years ago, and this is our recent example of network deployment. Uh, so in Poland, we deployed a 380-kilometer network with um, PSNC, and it's really interesting to see how they were able to deploy and configure uh, on their own um, this, this network uh, uh, in, in Poland. So if you you want to have more details, of course, on all this example, uh, feel free to contact us offline. Um, we have uh, a large QKD network of 29 links um, in Korea. This was uh, actually uh, added as an option for a secure, a new secure data network, and this was a major differentiator um, which allowed to win this project. And of course, in Europe, it was mentioned by Montiel, and we we are we have started this open uh, QKD uh, phase uh, to build this uh, UPCI network. So we provided 16 QKD pairs, and it's just the beginning of uh, the uh, UPCI journey, which aims at being fully operational by 27. Um, so as as um, <coughs> maybe a conclusion, I would say that. Um, uh, our advantage as ID Quantic is uh, to be able to uh, deploy QKD networks and uh, in operational environment. So we use uh, existing fibers, of course, infrastructure, and we connect to existing um, uh, networks provided by the well-known network vendors uh, of the market. And we, we focus on the, um, the QKD layer to uh, the extra uh, security to offer the long-term uh, security uh, on the key exchange part. Of course, we combine it also with the uh, encryptor that support QNG and, and QC. For example, uh, uh, we enter work with Thales, we implemented uh, QNG and PQC, um, and adding the KD layer and the KMS layer, as I said. And the main focus on our, our side, as you understand, is that uh, our customers are fully autonomous to configure, operate um, uh, their, their, their devices and their network, and they benefit from um, updates, release, and new features as we develop them um, along the quarter. Um, so this is a brief overview of ID Quantic um, and QKD network activity. Uh, but uh, feel free to contact us uh, also directly for more details. Thank you, Jean Sebastian. Uh, that was very on time. And uh, do you follow a standard also to integrate uh, QKD and PQC? Or, um, yeah. So, yes, effectively. So, uh, on PQC side, there are two, two aspects, I would say. is the, the, uh, the main one is the uh, PQC um, implemented by our partners, so on the on the net secure network device. Um, so they replace or they add, let's say, RSA key exchange to this, uh, this PQC uh, algorithm that were recently announced uh, by NIST. And also, of course, uh, the use of PQC within the QKD um, devices for all, let's say, external communication. Uh, it, uh, it's important, of course, that we are also we implement this crypto agility 
uh, to make sure our QKD uh, device also uh, can can leverage QC uh, for all classical communications. Okay, and um, there is also a question from um, the audience, uh, which can be more general, I think, than uh, for ID quantic uh, only, so it can be related uh, relate to all the panelists. From Hong Kong Law, is there any plan to move beyond trusted relays design in the future and to, to do, for example, MDI QKD or other protocols like threat sharing? So yes, for, for sure, the objective, the, the, the end objective, I think, for everyone is to, to be able to, to exchange um, uh, and to have the, the quantum communication end to end. So there, there are several options there, but so the, the quantum quantum repeater uh, would be needed, and uh, this is a, an access that we, we follow, uh, of course. Um, but today, let's say I focus on, on, on live products that we can deploy, and, and uh, it's not the case. And uh, for a measurement device independent QKD, are there plans in ID Quantique? Or... So I, I won't disclose all details of the roadmap, but um, as I said, for sure, we, we, we need to, and we follow uh, all innovation related to QKD uh, from the community as well. And uh, we'll disclose the, the next generation uh, probably uh, probably uh, in the coming uh, months. But uh, for, for now, I would say we focus on DVQKD. This was one of your questions. We focus on DVQKD today and product that can be deployed live in, in data centers and um, at quarter enterprise uh, sites. So that's, that's our focus. OK, perfect. Thank you very much, Jean-Sebastien. And uh, I'll move on uh, <coughs> to the next speaker. And, uh, Thank you, which is from Kiri Quant. I'm not sure I pronounced it well, uh, but Imran can correct me if I'm wrong. So the next speaker is uh, Imran Khan, and he is, has chaired the OpenQKD project that was mentioned in a previous presentation. And uh, he participated in the steering committee on the quantum flagship project Civic, as well as well in, in other EU projects. So he is one of the founders of the a com quant uh, company and uh, in his role of managing director um, he is driving the vision of industrially scalable quantum cryptography through the photonic integration of cv UKD. so imram the floor is yours thank you can you hear me yes perfect so let me try to share my screen then i hope you can see this yes Okay, perfect. So um, thanks thanks uh, a lot for inviting uh, us and myself here um, to QCrypt. The first one that I've been joining was uh, to, uh, to, uh, 2013. And I think Norbert Lutgenauz and Vadim Makarov locked us in a room and uh, asked us to calculate the security proof. And uh, only then we were allowed to leave. So um, today um, I'm managing director of KeyQuant. Um, and uh, as you already mentioned, our vision is to develop scalable um, quantum cryptography. Um, this is where we're sitting. And uh, our mission and motto is uh, we secure European infrastructure. And one of the big reasons for that is that uh, the topic itself is about securing. It's that are maybe divided uh, among continents right now. So uh, we focus in Europe and one of the uh, main aspects of our companies that were 100% EU funded by local business angels uh, and in intend to, to stay that way. That's why uh, we want uh, to secure European infrastructure in the future. Um, our scientific heritage is with the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Light and uh, Christoph Marquardt's group. And uh, as was already mentioned, we participated in a lot of uh, public projects both on the national and EU level and also contributed to, com to the community by for example uh, doing the first 10 gigahertz uh, CVQKD experiment um, I think it was back at QCRIP uh, 20, 2015. Um, now uh, we're currently building a strong team um, so we're, we're carefully selecting um, who uh, can contribute and uh, trying to building a, an environment that's lots of fun uh, um, to work in and uh, we're looking for new people so if you're interested please contact us 
Um, it's a mixture of uh, tech people and business people because, uh, as was already mentioned, there's a lot of need to develop the market and uh, develop into networks um, rather than just uh, having a single QKD system somewhere. Um, you asked about the, the future market and uh, we see that um, first customers are inquiring about um, the solutions that are available now and of course the, the Digital Europe program is giving a big market push um, to the European ecosystem in terms of um, procuring systems for the national test beds that are coming up in the next few years. Uh, we expect uh, this market to grow uh, a lot uh, with uh, photonic integration and uh, with the market coming out of the, let's say, governmental push into a real commercial market. And uh, the final market size we expect uh, for now for the EU market is about 3 billion and probably can scale that uh, somehow to, to, the, to the world size. But maybe other companies have a bad idea about that. Um, um, Another question that was asked is um, what makes our company uh, unique, what's our special advantage and we also use uh, CV QKD um, and uh, we have a, a, a product in development right now which is a QKD system in a 19 inch rack box but I think the main point of the company is not to develop another 19 inch rack box but rather to go to something that's a lot smaller and um, there's a few aspects coming with it so um, smaller I mean size is, is the obvious one but of course if you go towards photonic integration there's uh, there's also a cost aspect um, but um, something that people sometimes forget is that size and cost uh, is, is not uh, everything but if you put stuff on a wafer then you can also mass produce it so this means a volume and um, this is something that I think the QKD community hasn't seen yet we don't have any manufacturer that does a thousand systems and um, uh, we think this is crucial um, to uh, scale the, the market and um, last but not least is uh, the aspect of security because right now all QKD systems um, rely on the word of a quantum physicist claiming it's secure but um, of course the community knows uh, that this has to be changed for certifications and this is one of the uh, most important aspects because uh, the commercial systems won't be of any use if they're not secure, at least not uh, certified by the national authorities um, or other uh, standards like common criteria. Um, besides that, we also offer a, a vendor agnostic key management system that kind of uh, sits in between QKD systems and encryptors and doesn't care whether the QKD system comes uh, from one or the other company or whether the encryptor is from one or the other company. The idea is to um, uh, enable telecommunications uh, providers um, to have their own KMS network and then just procure whatever other devices they intend to have. And another thing we have in development is our space quantum random number generator that might be a thing for the future. Um, now the to-dos for the research community um, is develop standards so we can have certification. Tobias already mentioned this, we want to make uh, the security proofs closer to the real devices. Um, I think it's important to explore use cases uh, for QKD to learn uh, new aspects uh, for research since um, this will open up new fields of research um, and also there's uh, a need to develop new protocols to increase the general performance. And uh, finally, um, the existing standards are good but um, we need a more concrete uh, implementations of those in order to learn about their security requirements. Yeah, with this, uh, let me thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Imram, uh, for a very effective talk. I, I finally see some cost on top of QKD devices, not only diagrams. And um, can I ask if you have already started the process of integration that you mentioned in your talk and also if you think that integration helps security i mean the practical security of qkd or not uh, the first chips are going to be here soon uh, hopefully if the foundries uh, manufacture them in time um, so uh, this is started and uh, back in our scientific days we also collected some experience um, uh, working on those and uh, um, essentially operating all the, the, the single building blocks on these devices like lasers, modulators and so on. Um, and uh, on the electronic side, which has not to be forgotten, we also have uh, a, a very nice development which integrates a lot of the processing functionality on our own um, um, 
let's say, highly specialized telecom electronics. Um, and in terms of security, that's a tough one. Um, I think in principle, it, it, it uh, starts with a question of supply chain. Um, so can you trust the devices that you're using? But I don't think the optics is really a problem in the supply chain because uh, it's mainly the electronics that you have to be sure that it does the right thing, right? So um, probably the optics is not as critical as, as electronics would be. And then if you go towards uh, integration onto a, onto a single chip, um, um, and if, I mean, maybe you've, you've seen it on my slides, um, there was a word quantum pluggable mentioned, which is a good concept uh, borrowed from telecom. But the question is, can you certify these things independently, like a QKD host system, and then let's say a, a QKD hardware that does whatever it's supposed to do. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's CV, QKD, or DV, or whatever inside that pluggable just has to be certified. And what I learned is that in principle, there are mechanisms to certify these independently, but um, this has to be explored in detail. And maybe this is the right way to go, but we have to find out as a community. Yeah, a good goal for research, good target. Let's see. Thank you very much, Imram. And um, now I'll move on Thank to you. the next speaker. Uh, this should be uh, from uh, Kat. Quantum, and um, but I cannot see him among the, the speakers. Perhaps I'm wrong. Um, Robert, Robert Starkwood, Robert, are you there? Can you shout if you are? No. Uh, no. What? No. I don't seem to. Oh, yes, in the chat. Robert writes something here, but uh, I guess we cannot. We yeah, I think you should basically log out and in again, and log in as a panelist, Rob. So uh, I'll give you time to do that, and uh, for the moment I'll move on to the next speaker then, and then we go back to cats as soon as possible. Okay, so. Right then, um, I'll move on to Vanessa. Um, so, um, from Lux Quanta. Uh, Vanessa Diaz is business developer director at Lux Quantum, where she leads uh, the activities related to market development, customer engagement, and strategic partnerships. Vanessa, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marco. Hello, everybody. It's a real pleasure being here with you today and sharing some news uh, about the QQD state of the art. Um, so oh, I've prepared, are you hearing me? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So let's crack on. Um, what I've brought here is actually a picture of a quantum computer. We always live with that. And it's actually one of the reasons why QKD hasn't gone away completely. Not at all. Actually, it has a promising way uh, moving forward. And it's because this technology is becoming more a reality. The level of investment across the world is uh, rising crazily. And we have, we have been all these years because of that, a little bit in the shadow. But now it's actually gaining our technology a lot of importance, not only because the quantum computers are closer than ever, but because the whole world is becoming more and more aware about the fact that cyber attacks can be more dangerous to the stability of a democracy than guns and tanks. And that was Jean-Claude Juncker, the ex-president of the European Commission a few years ago. But also there is the industry is also sizing the impact that a data breach can have in our economy. So for a private company, we're talking about millions, uh, 9 million, that was an estimation done by IBM last year. And this is just gonna get even worse because the more information we put out there, um, the more exposed we are to these um, risks. And that's what's gonna happen with the internet of things and the billions of devices that will connect us all even more and will help us transmit information digitally across the entire world. So QKD technology has been on the rise for many years is now kind of like exploding a little bit more than ever before. In parallel, we have this other tool, the mathematics, you know, the famous post-quantum cryptography approach. So improving the, the health of our mathematics to be able to protect our communications. This work continues and is essential because um, as Nis demonstrated, we do still need them for tasks as authentication, ciphering, 
and key exchange. Is this a great, a great complement as well to QKD? So everybody has been aware of the latest news about this um, con contest that has been running now for quite a few years. Started with quite a few mathematical problems that have been um, removed until we got to the, the finalists. And along the way, a couple of things happened. So one of them, Rainbow, fell in the third round. And another one that was a finalist, but just in the backside, so not exactly the, the right one, no, the, the three right ones that made it, also was cracked in a matter of um, hours. So both actually hit the news pretty strong. This does not mean that the mathematics um, are useless. Actually, we still need them for the cipher and authentication process. So it's actually good news that NIST is doing this contest because it's putting to a test this mathematics so we can complement our technology with them. But when we talk about uh, key exchange, it's always looking at what could potentially happen. There might be some very strong minds, mathematics out there coming with a solution to crack another of these fantastic algorithms in the future. It's always good to rely on the properties of physics instead of mathematics. And that's what we do. So that's the reason why the technology, as I was introducing before, is growing um, very strong over the next few years. I'm not sure because we see a lot of um, um, estimations out there in the market. So this is a pretty common one from inside quantum technologies. So they expect a quite exponential raise in the need of this technology over the next 10 years. So I'm not sure if it will go so strong because at the end when a technology is so, so new, even though it's not because it's been in the market for quite a few years now, but still the industry needs to come closer to it and understand that it's in fact quite mature. Um, so I'm not sure if it will go so strong, but it'll definitely happen um, sooner or later. We'll reach these maximum expectations in terms of sales. So what we see in the market is a um, very interesting approach. So each of these potential users are doing a, a different approach to technology. So we have the governmental institutions that they're going very strong, investing a lot of funds across the world. So in Europe, where LuxQuanta is based, we actually have this famous EuroQCI network that is going to connect all the countries to protect the confidentiality of our information. But it's happening as one well of the regions. We know the strong efforts of China. The United States most likely will also join in this race. But then we have other users of telecom operators. They have a different um, approach because the use they will give to this technology is different. They will be providers of it. And then we have other institutions very interesting, like the financials so or the banks. They have a very strong IT uh, group of people that actually know about this technology. They are, they are already testing it. So one of the things that we need to do is to still talk a lot about it and make everybody aware about the benefits of it, work with them, and make sure that we understand where exactly we can actually place it to solve the problems that each of these particular potential users know might have. So in the world right now, there are the most heard technologies in terms of, of QKD is discrete variable, continuous variable. You know very well the difference between them both. The discrete variable approach is using a set of um, components that it makes this solution super strong in terms of distances and reach. This is what the consolidated companies in the industry have been working on for a few years. Continuous variable on the other side has been now implemented by very little of us in the world. And we are in a very exciting race to make this technology uh, commercialized, basically, make it fully industrialized and put it out there. The potential of these technologies help with this ability to co-propagate, you know that, the, the quantum channel with the rest of the data. That's one of the things that we can strongly help with in terms of um, making it easier for the industry to adopt it. And the other thing, Imran was talking about it, um, is just the ability of compact this technology using a, a photonic integration. This is going to be another big game changer because we can help a lot to um, make this technology more affordable, more like a, a, a commodity kind of thing that can be used by some other, let's say, um, users like the ones that you saw before that might need to deploy it more in a mass scale. So what I think is that these two technologies are very much complementary. It's, it's a joy actually uh, have both available or close to available in the market. So we will be complementary. Most likely we'll see long haul networks em embracing the discrete variable approach that since they can reach longer distances and we will be helping on the continuous variable side with those metropolitan networks where we need to just crack on with it and make it a lot more affordable. So this is what we finally do in LuxQuanta. So it's a company that it was uh, born last year. So perhaps that's the reason why if you haven't heard from us, um, you will definitely from here now onwards. 
We were born in May last year, and even though it, it seems to sound like we have been alive for just a year, the, the reality is that the technology comes from the Institute of Photonics in Barcelona, and is the result of four, four years of incubation. So it was released when it was almost, you know, on the way of commercialization is right there. So our, our prototypes are, are pretty much halfway there. We actually were born with pretty strong investors from the private industry, alongside, of course, our mother, let's say, ICFO. And we operate from the city of Barcelona, hoping to attract a lot of talent because that's something that, you know, the quantum industry gets a lot. So in a, in a, in a summary, this is what we're planning to do, uh, bring our prototype to what you look, look at here, and just make sure that, of course, with the help of our sister company, Viewside, they are the ones that uh, manufacture the quantum random number generator, generator that lives within us. Just make sure that the design of these products can make PPD technologies a lot more affordable, easier to integrate uh, for protecting our communications for the years to come. So thank you very much. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, very interesting um, prospects for uh, for this, and also the first time I see someone speaking of uh, integration between DV and CD to PD system. So you're planning to provide both, if I understand well. Not in the Roma right now. No, the, the way I see this is, um, I always say that no one car fits all roads. Uh, so I think it, I'm not sure it's the right approach to say that one solution fits all. So I, I, I would like more this approach where we actually understand the benefits and the differences between the two technologies. We embrace that, and then we we deliver. We, we let's say um, propose to our customers what makes more sense for them. Okay, perfect. Uh, thanks a lot, and uh, I think uh, I will now go back uh, to Robert, who I can see online. So, yes, Robert Starkwood, um, he has uh, 10 years of experience working with quantum technologies, starting at the University of Glasgow and Harriet World for uh, working on superconducting nanowire single photon detector systems. And uh, Robert is now at Perth Quantum Security in Bristol. As a senior integrated photonics engineer, he's helping to drive the development uh, of chip to chip QKD systems. Robert, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you very much, Marco. Um, hopefully, you can hear me now. Okay. Yes. Great. So, yeah, so um, coming from uh, Cat Quantum Security, we're based in Bristol in, in the UK. Um, we spun out from Bristol University um, five years ago now. Um, and yeah, so we focused on the idea of protecting um, protecting information uh, from the threat of, of quantum computing um, in all locations and all places where this crops up around the world. And it's such a um, ubiquitous uh, resource really now. And the high value of it, you know, in itself is pretty much one of the strongest motivators um, against um, you know this very real threat that we all um, we all know about and we all you know, don't have to motivate. Too strongly um, how serious the, the the ongoing threat is from quantum computing. Um, the technology that CATS um, is really based around, is really born from, um, is this chip to chip UKD um, and chip based QRNG uh, technologies. So, um, with a lot of experience in um, integrated photonics within the company and within the founders, uh, we've really um, been basing our, our, our systems around. Um, yeah, these, these, these photonic chips um, as a platform and then building the entirety of the system you know, obviously around the chip, you know, people who um, who work with these integrated photonics are, are very aware that the um, you, you can integrate ever more parts of your system down onto onto a chip, but but really to, to run a whole system, there is, there's always a certain amount of support, um, support subsystems that go around it. So what we're doing is, is working at um, putting all those together into, into QGB systems and then and then really driving down the swap of, of the system as a whole. Um, you know, obviously, so you get into a box, into a, into a form factor, um, usually starting around 19-inch um, rack uh, and then pushing down towards smaller and smaller form factors. So you can see here pictured um, our QRNG product as well as our key distribution uh, in their current forms. Um, and pushing down to form factors such as the, the PCIe form factor and the QRNG, that really helps to to get integration down and, and, and swap down into, into a size that, where you can not only manufacture uh, faster and cheaper, um, but it's it's 
how it's easier for customers to see and how easy it can be integrated or, or, or integrated in large numbers and deployed at scale. Um, the, uh, yeah, so these, these are our two main products um, at the moment. So the uh, QRNG has its own uh, uses, so you can you can have those on their own to, to be sources of, um, of, of, uh, of quantum entropy, uh, aside from, from doing actual key exchange. Um, but then obviously those can be contained within the QKD system. And at the moment we're uh, deploying those in the rack mount form vector um, for doing uh, QKD. The, uh, this uh, photo of the QRNG in action there, just inside the, the, the chassis of the PC. Um, the, 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 we are aiming for low swap and, 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 and low size. And, and the, I guess the, the point that comes with that is that you're, we're talking about gigahertz rate of, um, of, of production of, of quantum entropy here. So um, we can use them as a resource, perhaps for things like um, virtual machines and, and for, for in a data center environment, you can be serving entropy uh, to, a, to a large number of customers really at a, at a sort of uh, a large, as a, as a product or service. QKD system, um, again, we probably don't need to explain the QKD system to too many people here, but um, currently sits in, in, in this right now. And uh, again, it's, it's, it's used for, it's a DV QKD system. We're doing chip to chip QKD. Um, and uh, within within each box, we've basically got the full full transmitter in, in the 19 inch rack and then the full receiver as well. So, so we've got a, a, you know, a, a receiver chip and, and, and detection and, and, and compute all happening in one place. Um, just going to show you a quick couple of the use cases we're, we've demonstrated so far. Um, this, uh, I guess, helps to highlight the low swap um, elements of, of the system. So uh, we're able to fly uh, a system on a tethered drone. Um, and this is where you basically put the, the whole TKDTX um, up onto this platform, which, which can fly, enabling a of sight and some free space uh, objects where it can be done. Um, and then the, the drone itself is tethered so that you can use a, a fiber optic link. Um, down to, uh, to the QKD uh, receiver. The, the applications of the, of the QRNG, as I said, also um, span um, or allow it to integrate into, into other types of systems as well. So, so one of where we're not just doing um, quantum uh, key distribution, but uh, we've um, been able to show a, an integration with the PQC system, uh, which allows this quantum so safe certificates, which actually integrates uh, the idea of quantum safe entropy into a sort of broad and more applicable security environment where you're using authentication and, and such like from B2C. Um, and that really talks to, uh, yeah, sort of deeper integration into a, into a crypto ecosystem, which is, you know, often when, when a customer is looking for a, you know, they're looking for a secure solution. They're not saying to, to us, we specifically wanted to be QKD. So, the idea of, uh, of that broader integration into the system sort of helps to, to let the, 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 the quantum products find their place. Um, another very important element that we think uh, is part of this, you know, is, is, is um, certification and, and, and verification of the products. And so um, uh, we're, we're currently on a, on a working on this actually run project with a, um, a lot of companies in the UK uh, and beyond where we are. Uh, yeah, looking again to, to expand and improve the ways in which certification and standardization um, can can promote uh, the products because you know, I, I think we'd all agree strongly that the right the right standardization the right the right certificates give a huge amount of confidence mm -hmm. to uh, customers and to deployment uh, in order to allow us um, or in order to encourage people to to, to take up the, the the products rather than needing to rely on the say so of uh, your, you know, your favorite physicist or whoever you can access for uh, uh, expert advice. Um, again, this, um, I think this project's already been mentioned a, a few times, but the, um, the, the, the QCI project, which is a, which is a wonderful large scale project about deploying systems and testing them in the, in the Paris metro area. And again, we're putting some equipment in, into the, uh, into that project. Um, there's another. Uh, use case which we're doing to try and expand the the, the distance and the reach of the QKD, which is uh, integration of uh, a QKD um, network and key management layers um, into intercontinental systems. So uh, we've currently got some demonstrators um, going up, which would uh, allow um, for interoperability of, 
of metro area networks between the UK and between Canada, in, in, in this case, uh, linked via satellite QKD links. And, uh, and, and we're working to, uh, we've recently been showing that our key material demonstrated doing file shares between uh, Canada and, and the UK, uh, and the idea of creating a, a, a platform which is uh, it's a product agnostic and allows um, you know different vendors to have their equipment installed and running in uh, in metro areas in, in these different continents. Um, but it, it creates this sort of key management um, and sharing program which can connect nodes um, over the various types of links. Um, uh, I think should uh, is this your final slide, Robert? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So um, just quickly to say that the uh, you know, uh, another recognition is that if you're if we're deploying QKD systems um, with a low swap and they're coming down to a small size but still able to achieve high high key rates, um, then these kind of things can be deployed at large scale um, in, into infrastructure such as data centers where we're talking about you know, many many numbers of units, but being able to um, as I said, be deployed in, in, in large numbers and, and service um, these, these these larger bits of, of data center infrastructure. Uh, so that's uh, what we're doing at Cats. Uh, we're uh, we're an ever growing uh, team. There's many of us now. So uh, if you're interested, um, please do contact about uh, coming to Bristol, sunny Bristol. But um, yeah, uh, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Robert. Uh, I have so many questions, but I think I should move on in the interest of time because everybody should be able to present and we are behind, unfortunately, behind schedule. Um, okay, so uh, I'll move on to the next speaker who is uh, Davide Bacco and uh, he is uh, co-founder and uh, CEO of Quantum Telecommunication Italy, UTI, and assistant professor at the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Florence. Davide, when you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marco. I think you can see my slides, correct? Yes, that's yes. correct. Yes. So, good morning, good afternoon to everybody, and thanks a lot for the kind invitation. Um, basically, the, the outline of the talk is reported here, and uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit who we are and uh, what we do, actually, where we are coming from. And uh, towards also the end of the presentation, I will uh, give you some more ideas on what we have done in the past uh, and what are the future developments uh, and basically the products that we have available today. So Quantum yeah. Telecommunication Italy, who we are, is actually a spin-off of uh, the National Research Council in Italy. And uh, we, it was basically funded in late 2020. And uh, the, we are actually six people who founded this company with different background from quantum optics, telecommunication engineers, uh, but also mean uh, entrepreneurs. And uh, what happened last, uh, last year, actually one year ago, is that uh, we had basically an investment from the biggest telecom Italian operators or TIM team through another company that is called the Telsi. Telsi is the main company, a main driver of the cybersecurity in Italy. And it is a 100% uh, property of team and is focusing on building cybersecurity and cyber and uh, cryptos, uh, and which is uh, one of the most important, let's say, device, I mean, just beside QKD. In a sense that we know quite well that uh, one thing is to generate and being able to create uh, asymmetric keys, but then this key has to be used by ciphers. And that's our unique proposition here, because uh, we can have uh, basically everything starting from the quantum layer, which is QTI. We have Tessie, which is uh, this uh, company really focusing and working on ciphers uh, for uh, 50, from 50 years. And then we have a telecom operator being able to deploy and actually helping the deployment of a quantum key distribution. So regarding our background, everything started back in 20, 2018, 2019. Indeed, thanks to a collaboration, we were able to demonstrate uh, the first uh, quantum key distribution uh, um, through the Italian quantum backbone in, uh, in 2018 in Florence. And in particular, we use uh, a kind of a, a simple VB84 protocol with a uh, discrete variable approach using time being encoding. And this was demonstrated in a piece of the Italian quantum backbone, which is this very long connection between uh, Torino and Matera, which is currently used for deploying uh, 
and for uh, transmitting uh, the time frequency signal. These are also generated some patents, I mean, also, I mean, besides the paper, which is the basis of the QTI. Then we want to move basically from a research to more concrete approach to more something more concrete. And we demonstrated the first use case. In particular, we the quantum encrypted ball that was um, established between the University of Trieste and the harbor of Trieste that were more or less five kilometers of distance. This was possible thanks to QTI, I mean, devices. And I mean, uh, in the picture here, you can see that there was the former prime minister of Italy that was uh, established a connection with uh, the rector of uh, the University of Trieste. This was achieved in 2020 during the European Science Festival located in Trieste. Last year, we also did something, let's say, more, uh, a little bit bigger, and uh, we created uh, the first, uh, let's say, small uh, quantum network between uh, three countries uh, in Europe. In particular, uh, we managed to connect uh, Italy, Slovenia, and Croatia by using a trusted node approach. And uh, during the G20 event, uh, we ran basically these QKD protocols uh, for uh, demonstrating another use case uh, for made it possible a real, a real concert distributed between uh, the prime ministers. And this was, let's say, demonstrated last year at the G20 event, still in Trieste. Some more details about uh, our products. In particular, here you can see the current brochure. And uh, we currently have uh, three different types of products. Uh, the name of our product is called the Quell X, uh, and uh, it's divided between, uh, let's say, the different uh, specs. In particular, Quell X, I mean, is the first product. Uh, it is able to be to distribute quantum keys, uh, and uh, it can be connected. Uh, can be connected to other um, to all the different type of ciphers. Quell XC instead, I mean, it's a unique, let's say, product uh, combined with expertise of QTI and TLC. Quell XR is more for research and development. You can get access to the raw data. I concluding saying that we are not only active, let's say, you I know, mean, on the market, but also the research sites. And here, just I mean, briefly mention a few of the projects that we have started. In particular, I mean, I'm quite proud and looking forward to the EuroQCI projects that we just basically been notified. And I mean, if you have questions, I'm available for you, your, for your answer. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Davide. Very interesting development and very nice to see this growing company. And uh, the next panelist is uh, uh, also from Italy. And uh, I will move directly on to him because time is short. So, uh, Simone, if you can uh, start preparing your screen. Simone Capelletto is co-founder and CEO of Think Quantum uh, SRL startup and spin-off of the University of Padua, providing quantum solutions for cybersecurity, such as fiber, free space, satellite QKD platforms, and uh, high-end QRNG devices. Simone, when you're ready, the floor is yours. Uh, Uh, Simone, can you hear us? Simone? Oh, it seems to have problems. Uh, to, in order to not waste time, let me move on to the next speaker. And uh, I ask uh, um, I ask someone to uh, fix this problem for Simone. Uh -huh. So. Uh, Okay, um, so Robert, uh, are you there? Uh, yes, okay. can, can you okay. hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Excellent. So the next speaker uh, is uh, Robert Woodward um, from uh, Toshiba uh, CRL, Cambridge Research Labs. He's a research scientist and team leader at Toshiba Europe, based in Cambridge. His research investigates new fiber-based QKD technologies and their integration into existing network infrastructure. Uh, Robert, when you want, the floor is yours. Thank you. 
Thank you, Marco. Um, can you see my slides full screen? Yes. Uh, Excellent. Yeah. Yes, that's yeah. Yep. Um, okay. Um, so thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'll give a very brief overview uh, of Toshiba's uh, approach to QKD and some of our science and technology, uh, trying to keep within the five minute uh, window. So I'll start by noting um, we're based in Cambridge in the UK. Uh, and we've actually been developing QKD for uh, a very long time. So we were founded over 30 years ago, uh, and it's really in the last 20 years that QKD has been a particular focus. Uh, and for us, DVQKD has always been our technology of choice. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that later. But just highlighting some of the uh, landmark results we achieved in the lab. Um, you know, going back 20 years, QKD was much more immature than it is now. So achieving things like 100 kilometer distances, uh, and one megabit was, was quite a big advance back then. Uh, we've also worked quite a lot with networks and integration. So we firmly believe that um, if you want to have the maximum um, you know, number of deployments and the maximum benefits to customers, QKD needs to be able to coexist with classical existing networks. There's too much sunk investment to simply create a parallel um, QKD network next to, to, you know, alongside every classical network. So coexistence and the ability to multiplex and being able to deal with the, the noise the classical light can generate on a quantum channel uh, is very important practically. Um, another big development um, actually led by, by our chairman, uh, Marco Lucarini, was the development uh, while he was at Toshiba of the TF-QKD protocol or twin field QKD. Uh, which really redefines the scaling relationship between key rate and distance and enables you to effectively double the maximum reach uh, of QKD. And then we've uh, very recently actually launched a product building on this 20 odd years uh, of R&D. And alongside the lab based work, we've also done a lot of technology validation in the field. So we've worked with, with partners uh, in terms of research and also more recently in industry and commercially to really take this technology out to customers. Uh, and particularly this network we launched in London earlier this year in collaboration with BT, uh, we've already signed up um, EY, one of the largest management consultancies uh, who are looking to protect their data. Uh, and it's really nice that we can offer them a quantum safe service using QKD. So by means of a quick summary of our products, um, these are available now and uh, manufactured in Cambridge. We offer two variants, a long distance one, which can go up to 30 dB channel loss. That's about 150 kilometers or a multiplex system. So that uses a 13, 10 nanometer quantum channel in order to achieve maximum coexistence of classical and quantum light on the same fiber. Uh, and we can typically pack out the entire C band with user data as well as multiplexing our quantum light. So a, a big benefit for, for metro networks and existing lit fibers. Uh, our protocol is based on a modified version of BB84. And in terms of positioning, um, we typically um, advertise ourselves as having uh, the highest secure key rates uh, and the longest range. And this is partly enabled by our choice of, of DV uh, or weak pulse QKD protocol. And the system was also fully turnkey and automated in terms of alignment and ability to install for customers, et cetera, as well as supporting the standards for things like key delivery, which is important for getting the keys out of the box uh, and to the customer networks. And then in terms of our, our science and technology, so I've mentioned we use a weak pulse QKD or DV as it's often called. And to us, this enables the highest possible performance. So we can have the highest secure bit rates and the longest distances, uh, which, which is important um, for many customers. And also it reduces the capital expenditure because the further your system can reach, the fewer systems uh, a user needs to purchase in order to build a large scale network. So there are many benefits to long reach systems. But another um, slightly more theoretical point, and I think Tobias actually alluded to this earlier, um, the BB84 DV QKD protocol um, is fully composable, and there are proofs that will say it's secure against general or coherent attacks. And this is in the fire size effect regime too. So effectively, the security proofs are fairly complete and fairly robust, um, at least for the protocol. Now, I don't believe, and I'm welcome to be corrected by some of my CV colleagues, um, but I don't believe CVQKD currently offers uh, fully composable uh, proofs, which also include security against general attacks. I think there are proofs for collective attacks and maybe some weaker forms of security, um, but I don't currently understand that um, there should be any protocols that are fully to the same level as DVQKD in the CV domain. Um, I'm not saying they can't be generated, they, they can be found, but at the moment, that to my understanding is, is the state of the art. 
And finally, two recent advances we've been working on at Toshiba. So we've taken the TwinFill QKD protocol to over 600 kilometers uh, distance. Uh, I believe there's a paper at QCrypt this week showing it going even further than that using the TwinFill protocol. And we're also working on photonic integration. So as the other speakers have commented on, this is a fantastic route to mass manufacturability, large scale, uh, you know, reduced size QKD. Uh, and this is an example of our chip, the size of a finger. We've, we've built chips for all the elements of QKD uh, and put them into a pluggable module. And uh, if you refer to that paper, you can see the full system operating. So finally, uh, Marco asked us to reflect on what can the community do to help industry and to see, keep this technology um, you know, going forwards. And I think for us, there's still a lot of interesting opportunities for science technology. So quantum repeaters need to be developed still, quantum memories, the scope for new protocols, new optical designs, uh, and also interesting questions about how do you grow this to build larger and larger networks. So I think the industry is in a very good place and I think there's a lot of uh, interesting science still to be developed. So thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, very clear, impressive, and uh, on time uh, presentation as usual. Um, there is a, a very uh, direct question from Hoi Kun Lu. Uh, you have the right uh, to to answer your way. But he asked, "What is the price of Toshiba QKD system?" <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, I can't comment that. I'm, I'm afraid, but I will make a general comment that, as with all technology, be uh, it QKD or otherwise, prices typically start higher and then reduce as the technology matures. And we're also, as many other companies are, working on ways to reduce costs. For example, photonic integration, I think, is a, a fantastic route to large scale, lower cost um, technologies. So hopefully okay. that's a side that, in an uh, interesting way. <laughs> can we say that the figure presented previously by Imran Khan in the order of 100k something pounds or euro is uh, about right? I, I think that magnitude would, would seem reasonable, but yeah, I, I can't comment further, I'm afraid. Okay. <laughs> And uh, there is another question uh, that uh, very quickly possible. Uh, I also had uh, this question basically when you presented the long distance and uh, uh, the multiplex protocol, they seem to have the same resistance to losses, 30 dB. So also yes. the multiplex protocol goes to the same distance as the long distance system. Um, they go to the same loss, but because the multiplex system is based on a 13, 10 nanometer quantum channel, yeah, right. the loss of silica fiber is higher. So the loss of silica at 1550 is 0.2 dB per kilometer, at 13, 10 it's about 0.31 dB per kilometer. So the maximum reach with the multiplex is about 100 kilometers compared to the 150 kilometers with the long distance system. M makes sense. And the repeating rate of the, of the system is always one gigahertz, right? The, the clock rate is always one gigahertz, correct. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Rob. And you, uh, let me move on and actually go back to Simone, uh, who had some technical problem earlier on, but now he's with us. So, Simone, I already introduced yeah. you actually <laughs> earlier on, so yeah. I will uh, <laughs> yeah. directly give you the floor when you're ready. Yeah. Thank you, Marco, for the invitation and all the committee. And uh, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me now? Oh, yes, I can. Okay, so thank you for inviting us and uh, let me show briefly make an introduction of who we are. So Think Quantum is quite new, but comes from, uh, uh, again, as uh, many industry in this, uh, this segment comes from a uh, university. So um, let me go back. Uh, we are a spin-off of University of Padua and uh, we are dealing with the cybersecurity based quantum technologies. We cover the full value chain, so from design and manufacturing to production and uh, uh, installation of systems. And we are a fully European, let me say, company. We are Italian shareholder and uh, our supply chain is basically European. And uh, uh, you know that uh, this could be also quite uh, a value. Uh, again, together with the uh, uh, University of Padova, we'd like to mention also Officina Stellare, that is a major industry, um, our major industrial investor that uh, helped us to fund the company. And uh, Officina Stellare is active in the space industry, in the telescope, manufacturing and design, and uh, is really developing with us a lot of synergy in the range of uh, free space, link, and also uh, satellite uh, operations. Uh, let me mention also a couple of people that are very well known in the Kukrypt community. Paolo Viroresi was presented also last year and Giuseppe Vallone that are quite uh, lonely in, uh, in this uh, industry. 
uh, my myself, I'm active, uh, I think I'm co-founder and a uh, company. I'm also quite active in the quantum industry consortium that uh, is the European uh, industry consortium that uh, put together all the company active in the quantum technologies because we really believe that uh, the community has a, a key function in developing the business, developing the market. So there's no competition before the market exists and the market can be built by the effort of everybody of us. Uh, again, I come also to the question sometimes. Uh, Uh, of Marco during my presentation, also the development uh, of the industry of uh, quantum communication. Anyway, uh, we have different signs and different metrics that uh, give us the indication that the market is growing exponentially. Uh, on the other side, the key, uh, so the question was how is the growth of the market? We know that there are different studies that uh, target to have in 2030 1 billion up to 5 billion. There was also quoted by Vanessa at the beginning of his presentation. And finally, we really believe that the, the key part, the key, uh, the key aspect is the timing, because this is something that is uh, movable according to the effort and the development of the market. So we know that the size will be huge of the industry, but Uh, when we will reach this in this situation is to avoid to have a technology driven industry but to have a market driven and a customer centric approach and this also comes to the point of what the researchers can do for this industry and i guess one point that i see is that uh, better performance is not the key sometimes it's better to have a more reliable devices to have uh, investment in this direction, standardization, we were meaning, we were uh, mentioning before, but also the like, is if the system is not reliable. So to all the people involved in the community, in the research, I think that is important to, to focus now on industrial parameter, that is reliability, uh, upscaling in the production and aspects that maybe are not as sexy as a new protocols or new uh, system. Basically, to have a, a customer oriented, a market oriented view means to start from the end. That is the vision that we have that is a, a system, a world where the keys are distributed via diverse uh, channels. We have uh, fibers, we have uh, free space, and also the satellite part. This is the vision. And then going back, going backwards, we can understand what to do. And we, you can also understand how we have developed our system and why. You know that uh, I think no need to explain in such a community that fiber are uh, really fit in communication in the so short range, as we say. Free space optical link are more connected with the application where you don't have a fiber connection or you have movable or temporary nodes. On the other side, satellite are uh, satellite and ground station, payload and ground station, and intended to cover larger distances. Of course, we have a variety of protocols, of system. We were mentioning before uh, discrete variable, continuous variable, and so on. But we see ourselves as a provider of a solution for an infrastructure that is a complex infrastructure having all these three channels. And for this, we have developed a platform that can work in the three of them. And our best compromise was uh, to have a discrete variables, polarization encoding that at the moment, according to our opinion, is the one that is fulfilling much better uh, the coverage of the different channels. This is our platform. And just to enter somehow in uh, some details for the community that is quite technical today, is uh, our system can work in fiber, free space, and satellite. One minute. And uh, One minute. we are based on qubit for sync. So, this, yeah, yeah. Synchronization is based on uh, the qubit themselves. So, for the customer, for the market, means you don't, is a direct stream we have for our current G to the preparation of the qubit. This is also important for the security. And then other aspects. I try to go. Uh, fast, IPONIAC, 
that, that is a configuration we are using that is pattern provide a fast and reliable component and then Alice and Bob as said can work in the different channels this is our vision and these are more or less the, the two platforms that are the uh, I don't know can you hear me yeah okay these are the two platforms that we have a cookie that is a cookie D platform that we have developed. And then we have a ticket. It is also a quantum random number generation system that we have both in OEM and a standalone version. I come now to the end and I thank again the organization for giving this great opportunity of the industry to start meeting together and to talk together. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Simone. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. And uh, I should say the, your audio was not perfect, unfortunately, but we managed to understand the most of it and especially the important parts. Also, I would like to bring to the audience, to the general audience, an interesting uh, exchange that uh, was raised by Robert uh, Woodward in his presentation about the security of CPQKD and was answered by Tobias Goering. So uh, the security of CPQKD against general attack was uh, proven and actually, I, if I remember well, also demonstrated in uh, experiments in back, back in 2013 uh, with an entanglement based protocol and then security proof for coherent state against coherent attacks are around since 2015. However, it is true that uh, they are uh, mathematically more complex to demonstrate. So thank you to our panelists. I hope now the general um, audience are aware of this uh, little discussion. And uh, finally, we can move on to our uh, last uh, speaker for today's session. And uh, I would like uh, to welcome uh, Yingmin Zhu. And um, he, he is a senior vice president of XT Quantech Co. Uh, he's mainly responsible for the design of QKD data processing algorithms and the research and development of quantum random number generator products. He is also involved in the standardization bodies uh, for QKD in China. So I hope he can give us some comments on that. And also uh, maybe some comments on the, the market, because we have heard uh, that uh, the, the, the total market is uh, expected to be around 5 million uh, US dollars in 10 years time. But actually I've recently read the paper uh, claiming that uh, only in China the, the market is expected to be uh, more than 10 million dollars uh, just next year. So I wonder if uh, Jim Min can uh, give us a better uh, view on uh, where we are uh, with these figures. So when you're ready, Min, the floor okay. is yours. Okay, thanks Marco. And uh, uh, thanks to the invitation from the QCRIP organization and uh, I am be very honored to be able to introduce our company on behalf of Xuntai Quantec and share our views about the industry. Firstly, I will introduce our company. Uh, the name of our company is Xuntai Quantec. The Xun in Chinese means follow and the Tai in Chinese means quantum states. And the meaning of Xuntai is that we will follow the, quantum, the rules of quantum states to realize some quantum technology. And the Xuntai is one of the quantum uh, company and we mainly focus on the continuous variable quantum communication technology. And uh, the four characteristics of our company are, firstly, we believe the quantum communication market has a great potential since this technology is valued by countries around the world. And secondly, we have more than 20 years of continuous variable quantum technology research experience including our invention patents and uh, research papers and we are now leading the formulation of CVQKD standards. And uh, the third part is that we have opened up the industrial application scenarios, uh, including the finance, electrical power system and telecommunication. And the last is our technology is come from the Shanghai Jiao Tong University and our teams are led by the professors and our members are all have are very professional in both hardwares and softwares of the quantum communication. And second part, I will share our view about the industry. 
Uh, the data security incidents occurred frequently in recent years, and uh, quantum communication is highly valued by the world. And uh, we believe just in China, the potential market of quantum communication can exceed 100 billion until 2025. The first part is the quantum communication backbone network, and uh, the second part is the private quantum network for various fields, such as telecom, finance, electrical power system, and so on. And the third part is the metropolitan area quantum network, and the fourth is the quantum secure storage to protect the data. And the last one is the QRNG chip, which can be equipped in the smartphone, Internet of Things, and the autopilot car. The third part is our core technology that is continuous variable QKD. Uh, the QKD uses the quantum physics to obtain the secure key with the information theory, theoretical security. And the QKD can be implemented by two technical rules. One is CVQKD and the other is DVQKD. And in CVQKD, we use the GG02 protocol and the key information is modulated on the quadrature components of the optical fields. And uh, we use the coherent detector, which is widely used uh, in the optical communication to detect the quadrature components. As we choose the continuous variable technique rules, uh, we have two quantum product metrics. One is the fiber-based QGD product line. We have developed the CV QGD series to solve the problem of the key management and the data transmission security and they can be used in the telecom operators, finance, traffic, and the electrical power system. And our customers uh, include the telecom operators and the devices manufacturers. The second part is our mobile quantum product line. We have developed the QRNG system and they can use to protect the data without deploying optical fibers. And they can be used in the cloud computing uh, internet of things. As we choose the continuous variable QKD technique route, uh, the advantages of our products are that uh, firstly, the CVQKD can have a higher key rates in the short and medium distance, and it's very suitable for the metropolitan area network and the access network. And uh, the components in CVQKD can be integrated and can be realized by the coherent optical communication module. So it can realize the small size and last is the signal in CVQKD can be co-transmitted with the classical signal. So we can use our existing optical network to realize the CVQKD network. And for our QRNG, we also realize the small size and the high generation rates. The last one is our plan. Uh, for the product development path, we will gradually realize the miniaturization and the civilization of QKD and the QRNG. And we believe the quantum communication industry is now in the initial stage of development. And we will see the market eruption a few years later. And before the market eruption, we think the researchers in the quantum communication can contribute in three aspects. The first is to promote the standardization of the QKD and the QRNG. And the, the, the second is to miniaturize the quantum communication devices. And the last one is to develop the quantum network protocol to broaden its scope and increase the number of QC users. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Jingming. Uh, very clear and uh, to the point. So when you said uh, 100 billions, clearly billions, I think I said the millions, but clearly it's billions. 100 billions in how many years? Uh, until 2025. Okay, right. So this is um, almost um, one uh, order of magnitude bigger than uh, most optimistic predictions that we heard earlier on. I wonder if uh, any of the other panelists wants to quickly comment on these numbers, uh, maybe Vanessa or uh, Simone. Um, unfortunately, that should be very quick in case because uh, I don't think we have time to discuss lo for long. But I can see Simone coming online. Do you want to comment on these numbers? Uh, maybe a comment that is more qualitative. I guess it's also a, a, 
a self-fulfilling statement what we do today what we say today because the more the industry play together to develop the market the more uh, the market will grow i guess i still really in this phase uh, is also something that we can still influence what is the final target right uh, I mean, for sure. Uh, so it's very early stage. So essentially, the, the final result is quite unpredictable. Someone asks 100 billion in which currency? I assume it was in yuan, probably referring to the Chinese market, but it's, I uh, guess so. it's, a, it's a good question. Um, no. If I made the study that uh, all of us has under, I think, has, has got, I guess, range uh, from 1 billion to 10 billion i guess this is the range of value that uh, i have seen so far and uh, maybe mm -hmm. depending also on how many layers you include because i guess what is the quantum communication is uh, okay maybe including quantum uh, the key management yes and then how far are you go in the in the layers you know this is changing completely the numbers you get at the end the assumption uh, let me... yes that makes sense. So we'll take that as a final figure for for this for for today. Um, we are a bit over time, unfortunately, not much much time to the, for discussions. Uh, however, I want to give space to any of the panelists if they have pressing questions to quickly discuss among us and with the remaining audience. Well, uh, excuse me, Marco. I, well, the organizer just informed me that since we have so many uh, speakers gathered together for now, so uh, I think we can give you more time for mm -hmm. for the discussion. So no problem, can keep on going. Ah, okay. Well, that's good news. Thank you very much. So uh, let's assume we have more time to discuss that. Uh, I, I, I've seen Vanessa unmuting herself, so I have one comment on this number. No, just complement on what Simone was saying and what you were pointing at. So we would need confirmation on what um, currency that was coming from and also what market is looking at. Um, so many things that can happen. I think it's on the on the way to uh, experience an important growth. So how well, as I was saying, you know, how exponential that growth is is yet to see. And then the other factor to take into consideration is a potential delay once again because there was a delay already because of the pandemic. Um, so I don't know if this recession that is coming might impact as well our market too. But I will delay it probably for a year, no more than that. And then what we, we see in every um, stimulation is, is going to happen. Right. And uh, another question that was raised uh, was about photonic integration. I think we all agree that this is an important aspect that we should uh, aim to. Uh, however, how how does that appear to be in, uh, in respect to the continuous variable and discrete variable implementation? So is there any difference in that aspect? For example, I wonder if uh, Katz, Robert can comment on the integration of uh, single photon detectors in the discrete variable case. Yeah, certainly. So, um, you know, it, to compare, CV and DV, there's obviously uh, different requirements on the system, um, and they, they they do lead to, uh, or they would lead to different choices that you're going to make on on platforms. And as I said, there's um, there's certainly, you know, we have at the moment um, a certain level of integration within within the RX and in the photonics components that that we have in a DV uh, receiver. Um, and although there is space for more integration, there's always more space for for co-integration with as I said, all of the subsystems which make up the receiver, um, I think there's a there's a choice that has to be struck um, as as you develop products along along the line, um, in the ones which can be delivered um, where the, where the whole operating system uh, with all the parts is actually deployable um, at a certain scale. Because um, perhaps at the moment one of the you know one of the, the issues is that if you co-integrate. Um, detectors um, and, and receiver photonics that need uh, large amounts of cooling. Um, although you, you're having a lot of the um, quantum effects happening on, on a single chip, you're actually having to trade up to a much larger system that needs more cooling and, and, and more stabilization. So, in fact, um, I'd say that there's a 
in order to achieve maximum integration, there's a sort of staging needs to go on. Um, and at the moment, you, if you were to place everything on, on one chip, you'd actually need to build a bigger system around it um, to cool it um, than, than by having co, um, co packaged uh, items. So uh, I think that uh, we'd like to see a, a place where where we do get the technologies um, up to a up to a level where we can we have reduced um, size cooling and, and and we can actually um, have monolithic integration of a, of a receiver module and then we're really talking about those those little pluggable form factor um, products um, but uh, but yeah there's, that's that's a little way ahead on, on on the development roadmap. Okay, this probably also depends on the integration of transmitters or receivers. In some cases, maybe receivers can remain more bulky than transmitters, depending on the architecture that you want to, to tackle. I can see Davide has raised his hands. Do you want to no, say I, something? <laughs> yeah, I, on this topic, actually, but you just mentioned in a sense of that in the long term vision, we don't need, for example, to have both a transmitter and receiver in a both integrated in a complete way. Also, I mean, I remember that we started uh, in this talk uh, focusing on MDI QKD, for example, right? So if we look uh, towards this direction, for example, in which we have multiple uh, transmitters, which could be very integrated, uh, very small, as we saw from uh, from Robert in his presentation, and a centralized node as a receiver, right? I mean, it could be also a solution uh, for in, uh, to go in this direction. Monchil? Sorry. Uh, so what I want to say is uh, that actually photonic integration is very important, but actually it addresses one segment and actually the physical segment. And uh, there is one, a QQD system, as we all know, is a combined system between optics and also post-processing and post-processing, especially in CVQQD is very important. So I want to want to say that actually this has not to be omitted. This is very important. There are solutions for interaction with PGA and so on, but uh, this has to be taken into account very, very seriously. And because I fear a tendency of the community to focus on the physical segment while ignoring the rest, which is not good. I mean, sorry. Suppose that actually uh, considering all the segments in a QPD system, which is an integral system, is very important. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, Imran uh, mentioned also the importance of uh, the electronics indeed in this talk. So, Imran. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, one thing I want to, to highlight again is um, if you, I mean, looking back at the presentations, a, a lot of people highlighted uh, photonic integration and uh, I also saw some pluggable modules. Um, and I want to draw a comparison uh, to quantum computing where there's, um, let's say, quantum computing scientists who are now developing hardware platforms um, in the sense that uh, what's the best kind of qubit, what's the best error corrected qubit and so on and so forth. And there's companies that build the ecosystem around it like uh, software languages in Python to control these qubits and gates and so on. And I wonder whether that's an approach we could use in quantum communication as well. Whether you can have, let's say, quantum limited, quantum operating hardware um, that works as it's supposed to work and it just exposes its capabilities to, to an upper layer of software um, and whether we could have, a, let's say, quantum communication programming language uh, in the same way as the quantum computing people will do in the future. That's definitely a nice suggestion. And uh, Jean-Sebastien? Yeah, thank you. So I had a remark more on, um, on the coexistence and multiplexing between CV and DVKD. So what, what we've seen lately is that um, it doesn't seem that CVQKD necessarily has an advantage um, when we see the, the performance we can achieve with DVQKD, in the, especially using the O-band. Um, so is there, is there any comment from, from the CVQKD community here, or, or DV, of course? But uh, I think the, the multiplexing and coexistence is, is, is not necessarily a major uh, advantage of CV. Um, Um, I could comment if you like. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think it's an open question. Um, so for, for the multiplexing part, uh, if you have a local oscillator in CV, it acts as a spectral filter, which is nice, which doesn't mean that uh, DV cannot do the same using uh, uh, a filter. But the question is, um, 
what will be the implementation of the filter? Will this be a, a, a big device? I mean, at least the, the narrowband filters that I know cost a few thousand euros and are kind of big things that are, let's say, on the order of a mobile phone um, with a screw attached to it, so you can change the wavelength of the filter if you have a C-band system. Or will it be something that can be integrated and can be tuned to the right uh, frequency? It's open to me. Maybe somebody else from the audience knows, but th I think the technological integration of the filtering is is an issue. Uh, and uh, yeah, maybe you could comment on that. C could I maybe comment on on that, perhaps? Um, so I'd argue that filtering is a very established thing with fiber bragg gratings. So this is where you write a periodic structure into a fiber. So the size is literally that of a, of a fiber. So it's absolutely minute. Um, so for fixed wavelengths, the size is the same length as 10 centimeters of fiber. So it's really not a problem at all. And you can get a huge, great, a great deal of versatility in terms of bandwidth positioning of your wavelength. Um, so that's, that's not a problem, I don't think, technologically. In terms of tunability, you, you're right, that obviously means a little bit more complexity, but people have shown that you can tune fiber gratings with strain or with temperature relatively easily. So, so again, we're talking very compact systems that, um, yeah, I, I really don't think would be a problem technologically in that sense. Yep, th uh -huh. thank you. That was new to me. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so, in fact, what I wanted to find out, of course, as Vanessa already pointed out, it depends what system where and so on. But there are some fallacies. For example, there is a fallacy that DV systems typically uh, have a longer range performance, which is not true. Uh, in fact, you can do actually very long distance with CV, uh, provided you can manage to reduce your noise, which we have done. Uh, so another thing is, of course, um, the CV systems, as already pointed by many people, are good at, let's say, uh, having different frequencies and uh, multi frequency and actually switching by frequency by direction is very native uh, and uh, together with uh, co propagation in a C band is very native to CV. So it appears uh, that uh, there are significant advantages also in this respect. I wouldn't say that actually uh, that, uh, there is at the moment a clear win between technologies and maybe different technologies could be applied to different domains. Yeah, thank you very much. Robert, want to comment? Interrupt, uh, Marco. Oh, no, you still have your raised hand, so. So I, I wasn't a comment too. Um, I was just going to say that um, I think there are also parallels between the, you know, the DV CV discussion and maybe in quantum computing, where people are looking at different platforms for quantum. So yeah, I think I, I would agree with the comment maybe we see that the, the jury is still out. Um, is there a best? You know, do we even need to decide if there's the best? Um, maybe not, not necessarily so. I think there's definitely scope that these different technologies can work together uh, and potentially all play a role in, in a future quantum ecosystem. Yeah. Imran? Yeah, um, good cue um, because uh, I wonder whether there would be uh, protocols that are compatible between manufacturers in the future this would be one for standardization in the community. I mean, why should uh, a key quant system care whether there's uh, a, another receiver from another CV company on the other side? Or, I mean, if you look at transmitters for CV and TV, they're pretty much the same, right? It's amplitude and phase modulation. Um, so it would be just a receiver that's different. Of course, sync is, is a topic, right? There might be uh, proprietary synchronization and so on, but in the end, uh, having a receiver that relies on some standardized protocol, why not? And uh, as such, uh, let's work uh, towards that. Yes, indeed. That's very interesting, of course. Standard, this is what standardization is for, isn't it? Uh, but also, it reminds me of the DIY do-it-yourself uh, QKD that was suggested by uh, Charles Bennett, uh, I think, a couple of years ago in QCrypt, where essentially you take all the transmitters that you like, all the receivers from another company, and then maybe you plug them all together to make your own system, and maybe you can trust this better than a system that is entirely made by one single company. Uh, I can see there is one question from the audience, if I am not wrong. Um, yes. yeah. From the organizer, um, I would love to see the discussion going on, but uh, we're running out of time. So probably, uh, would you like to wrap up in probably five minutes? Five more minutes? Okay, thank you, Marco. Okay, yes, thank you, no problem. Uh, Jean Sebastian, thank you. Well, I was also to say, effectively, I think it's important we 
we are able to mix uh, the different vendors, but probably short terms, uh, what we see more happening is uh, mix mixing so various uh, pairs or, or various links uh, into to QKD networks. So, and connecting the different islands of, of QKD networks that are deployed, I think it's effectively in, in benefit of, I think, the community overall. Um, maybe before mixing Alex, Alice and Bob from different vendors, but uh, uh, so that just a comment to to, to, uh, to Imran, um, and thank you for this uh, session. Okay, um, so uh, we still have four minutes, um, and I can see two questions from uh, the chat. First one, I think, is a difficult one. Uh, however, let me read it something that without quantum computers, QKD may not be a necessary technology. Could you discuss the relationship between the development of QKD and its dependence on the development of quantum computers? So perhaps I can turn this into a more industrial question, like uh, would you still be uh, chasing uh, QKD and uh, trying to penetrate the market if you know tomorrow that quantum computers are not possible? There is a no-go theorem for quantum computers. Would you abandon the QKD market or would you still be uh, in it? Imran. Um, I, I want to tackle it uh, from the way the, the question was originally written. I, I, I see your point, um, but uh, let me try to, to, to make a point of my own. Um, Vanessa men mentioned in some of the NIST developments that uh, PQC algorithms have been developed, right? And we're just uh, at the inception of quantum computing. So whatever uh, can be cracked in the future, we don't know. Um, but th the real point being uh, both PQC and QKD need uh, hardening, right? You develop something, uh, you have to check that it's really secure. For QKD, it's the boxes uh, that have to correspond to the security proof. And for PQC, it's the algorithms. But uh, PQC relies on the fact that um, some mathematical problem cannot be solved now or maybe sometime in the future, but we cannot be sure. So uh, we have seen this uh, cat and mice game uh, in all of human history for cryptography. Um, and I wonder if it's going on like that. I think the fundamental difference with QKD, and now this is the hypothesis that can be discussed, is uh, that it could converge in terms of security because you have to only do it uh, right once. We don't have to invent a new protocol because the security is in principle there. We just have to build a secure device. And I find this very interesting because this could allow for uh, making this very uh, cheap and ubiquitous. So mm -hmm. uh, this could be an aspect of uh, not caring for the quantum computer at all, but realizing that QKD is a new type of security that would converge in terms of uh, cost and uh, market um, um, yeah, realization. Okay, uh, Vanessa, just 30 seconds, because I don't think we have time to listen. No, it's okay. I have to add anything else on what Imran said. It is perfect. So the one question I guess I have for this question from the audience is, are we sure that somebody hasn't already cracked AES protocol, for example? We actually do not know. So there might be, um, maybe somebody is already going to college now to learn mathematics and becoming the person that will crack that in a few years' time. So that's the reason why even if quantum computers weren't there, um, if they stop tomorrow the the research and development process, we would still pursue the commercialization of a technology that it just protects our communications because it relies on quantum physics and that of those law laws, there is no smart person that can actually track them. Yeah, I like that. Thank you. And Monchil, final so word. Shortly, yeah, very shortly, just I heard uh, not very recently from a telecom operator the argument actually there is software security there is hardware security let's combine them we will be better off <laughs> thank you yes very good point so merging and not uh, splitting uh, technologies for a, for a better security that's great uh, so i don't think we have time to uh, answer andreas Pope's question about uh, roadblock for deployment please uh, answer them in the uh, in the chat if you have time and chance to do it otherwise uh, andreas can write direct to some of you and uh, have uh, an offline discussion i can see jean sebastian is typing the answer uh, for me i want 
to thank all the panelists uh, today for the nice se session and uh, all the great presentations. I hope and I'm quite sure that this was useful to the audience. And I hope that next year we can also expand the industry session to maybe a couple of hours to have more time for discussions. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Have a good continuation of your day or of your, or of your night. And uh, I hope to see you all very soon. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. bye. Speakers and thank you for spending extra time with us and uh, for further discussion. Thank you. And um, since we're actually a little bit delayed, so uh, I would like to ask all of our audience to join the um, poster session directly. So please go, please join the poster session on EventX right now. I think uh, the presenters are waiting for you right now. So uh, please log on to EventX and um, find your presenter accordingly. Thank you.